I'm Joe Lex. I'm a retired professor of emergency medicine in Philadelphia. I spent my entire career teaching and I couldn't stop when I retired. I became a volunteer tour guide at historic Laurel Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia. I am not trained as a historian, but it's impossible not to become fascinated with the stories of people buried here. Laurel Hill Cemetery has an excellent self-guiding app that you can download. It has very well done three to five minute presentations on many people who are usually covered in live hotspot tours by other guides. For the first time visitor, there's really nothing like discovering the tombs and the stories of Robert Cornelius, father of the first selfie or Sarah Josepha Hale, mother of Thanksgiving, General George Gordon Meade, the hero of Gettysburg, the mighty Patterson Lion, the heart-rending statue mislabeled mother and twins for many years, shark victim Charles Van Zant, and many others. Now, I am going to do something different for this virtual tour. I want to introduce you to many of my favorites who are either seldom talked about or not talked about at all. Two of them don't even have markers. I also do the podcast for Laurel Hill Cemetery and West Laurel Hill Cemetery. It's called All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories. And I will refer you there a few times in the middle of this. Normally, when I do a live tour, I would start at the gatehouse. I might take you to see Old Mortality, the grouping of statues that greets visitors to Laurel Hill. I would give you a history of the cemetery. Instead, I am going to refer you to podcast number one of All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Story. It's called The Origins of Laurel Hill. I'm going to start instead with someone who was born the year that the cemetery was founded. Oscar Huntington Alice was born in New York in 1836. That is the same year that Laurel Hill was founded. In 1866, he graduated from Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, and he took internship at Philadelphia General Hospital. In 1871, Alice became the first staff surgeon at Presbyterian Hospital of Philadelphia, which is now Penn Presbyterian Medical Center. While there, he made several major contributions to medicine. First, the Alice inhaler, which was a safer, more convenient way to administer general anesthesia to surgical patients with either ether or chloroform. One of the advantages was a removable absorbent filter, which could be used to titrate the drugs and then was easily cleaned and reused. This device itself probably saved hundreds of people from overdosing on the anesthetic agents. He also invented this very common tool, the Alice forceps or clamps. It's a surgical instrument with sharp teeth and locking arms. It's used to hold or grasp heavy tissue. For instance, the cervix of the uterus when inserting an IUD. It can cause crush injury, however. It's usually used in tissue that is about to be removed. But this instrument, I guarantee you, if you're not in medicine, it is used in surgery thousands of times daily around the world. Pediatricians still use Alice's sign, which is also called Galeazzi's sign, to assess for hip dysplasia. Flex an infant's knees when they're lying down so that the feet touch the surface and the ankles touch the buttocks. If the knees are not level, then the test is positive and there is a potential congenital hip malformation. Alice received the Samuel Gross Prize and $1,000 from the Philadelphia Academy of Surgery in 1895 for his monograph on hip dislocations. In the same year, a Philadelphia newspaper called him the father of orthopedic surgery at Jefferson College. He was so well respected throughout the community that he received an honorary LLD from Lafayette University in 1909. 
1877, Alice married Julia Thompson. One of their children, Oswald Thompson Alice, who's buried at Laurel Hill Cemetery in Section S, was a famed scholar and teacher of the Old Testament and co-founder of Westminster Theological Seminary in Glenside, Pennsylvania. He's buried down near Harry Callis and George Lorimer. One of Oscar Alice's books and another. On the 15th of April, 1912, the day of the sinking of the RMS Titanic, Julia died. Nine years later, in May 1921, Oscar Alice, MD, LLD, died of a stroke at his home at 1604 Spruce Street. He was 85 years old. Three days later, he was interred at Laurel Hill Cemetery, Section T, next to Julia. Next, I want to tell you about three members of the same remarkable family, the Craig family, Hugh Craig Sr., Hugh Craig Jr., and Wilson Darling Craig. They are buried very near the Patterson Lion and just across from the Biddle Plot in what's called Key Point in the central section of Laurel Hill Cemetery. This is their lot. Your eyes are not deceiving you. There is no marker. Hugh Craig was born in Ireland. He immigrated to Philadelphia in 1832. In 1836, at age 20, he started a grain business, millage, storage, and consignment. In 1846, his storehouse was destroyed by fire. Now, despite no obligation to do so, Craig repaid anyone who lost money in the fire. This way he gained the loyalty of dozens of farmers and businessmen around the city. Eventually he became a director of Delaware Mutual Insurance Company, the Corn Exchange National Bank, that building still stands on 2nd Street, and Pennsylvania Railroad Company. Craig married Catherine McCausland, daughter of Alexander McCausland of Philadelphia, who was for many years a Philadelphia bookseller. Hugh Craig Jr. was born in 1851. By age 16, he had joined Hugh Craig and company, and at age 23, he took over when his father retired. In 1871, he joined the 1st Troop Philadelphia City Cavalry. In 1878, he was elected treasurer and remained in that position for the rest of his life. He also served as quartermaster from 1881 until the end of his life. I do not have time to give you the whole history of the 1st Troop Philadelphia City Cavalry. It is fascinating. I suggest you look it up on your own. It was Craig who raised the money for and supervised the building of the armory building for this organization, which was finished and occupied in 1901 at Chestnut and 23rd Street. Hugh Craig Jr. never married. He carried a photograph of his mother next to his breast every day of his adult life. He was a world traveler, apparently admired and respected by all. The brief biography that I could find says that he had singular charm and lovableness of his personality, which endeared him to all those privileged to come within the circle of its influence. He died in 1913 at age 52. At his funeral services, 75 city troop members wore their full dress uniforms, and his burial at Laurel Hill Cemetery was with full military honors. In the autumn of 1917, Craig's sister, Mrs. Henry Reed Hatfield, fitted up the Craig's home on Chestnut Street as a club for enlisted men of the United States Marine Corps. It was to be used as a place for men on furlough in Philadelphia to stay. There was a dormitory which could hold 75 men, a bowling alley, pool rooms, shuffle boards, and a lounge connected with a ballroom. This club was discontinued only when the Marine Corps presence at Philadelphia Navy Yard was reduced. Wilson Darling Craig died at age 20 of 
hasty tuberculin thesis that are known as galloping consumption. He was a student at the University of Pennsylvania. There he was a member of Delta Psi and the Zelosophic Society. That's a secret group limited to 20 members per class through a selective tapping process. A few years after Wilson D. Craig's death, his brother and sister contributed $10,000 to Penn to have a dormitory named in his honor. The Wilson D. Craig Dormitory is one of the quadrangle dormitories, which is a complex of 39 conjoined residence houses at Penn. It is part of the earliest block built. The architectural firm of Cope and Stewardson designed the house in the collegiate Gothic style. John Stewardson, who was a good friend of architect Wilson Eyre, drowned while ice skating on the Schuylkill River in 1896. He is buried in the south section of Laurel Hill in section 14. 17 students can live in the Craig House. It contains the Goldberg Lounge and the Spiegel family lobby. So in this plot, we have several members of a very wealthy, prominent Philadelphia family in one of the premium pieces of real estate at the cemetery, if there is not a marker to be found. I have personally probed this entire area and not encountered one stone or marker. What is the reason for this? Well, it is found in the archives of Laurel Hill Cemetery. Hugh Craig died in 1878. On the 10th of May, 1879, a letter was sent to the managers of Laurel Hill Cemetery from several people who own plots near the Craig property. It stated, the undersigned lot holders in Laurel Hill Cemetery believe that the erection of a mausoleum in the lot held by the executors of the estate of Hugh Craig, deceased, would be objectionable from its size to the neighboring lots by obstructing the view and general landscape effects. And we trust that you will not put such an erection to be made under the rules and regulations of the cemetery company. It is signed by seven lot holders or executors of lot holders of nearby plots. And for this reason, one of the most spectacular views in the cemetery comes from a lot without a single marker because it might obstruct the view of dead people. If you stand on this lot today and you turn around 180 degrees, that is your view. We will come back to that. That's what's called the key point, and that's where the Biddles are buried. Three more members of another distinctive family, James Elverson Sr., Colonel James Elverson Jr., and his wife, Eleanor Nellie Mayo Elverson. Their plot is right on one of the main roads. It's a large mausoleum. James Elverson Sr. was born in England, but came with his parents to Newark, New Jersey in 1847. At 16, he was a telegraph operator, and at the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861, he was manager of the American Telegraph Office in Washington, D.C. He became friends with President Abraham Lincoln, Secretaries of War Simon Cameron and Edwin Stanton, and others. In 1865, he moved to Philadelphia and established two successful children's magazines. In February 1889, Elverson purchased controlling interest in the Philadelphia Inquirer, a failing two-cent morning paper with a small circulation meager news facilities and a small editorial staff. Philadelphia at this time was supporting 13 daily newspapers whose cumulative daily circulation exceeded 800,000. Elverson added the Sunday edition. He reduced the price to one cent, increased the size to eight pages of eight columns each, and put in the largest illustrating plant in the state. Circulation increased to more than 130,000 per day. In 1899, the Chester County village of Blue Rock was renamed Elverson in his honor. 
When he died in 1911, his son, Colonel James Elverson Jr., stepped smoothly into his role as owner and publisher, as he had been his father's right-hand man for many years. His crypt lists his date of death, age, and a quote from his friend, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Died February 10th, 1911, aged 72 years. There is no death. What seems so is transition. This life of mortal breath is but a suburb of the life Elysian whose portal we call death. James Elverson Jr. was born in 1869. He was destined for newspaper business. He learned every role in the business from bottom up. When his father died in 1911, he was 42, and he smoothly took over the business. Because of his involvement in politics, he received the honorary title of Colonel, which he used proudly. Colonel Elverson cherished the idea that a great publication deserved a great building, a memorial to his father. He realized this dream on July 13, 1925, when the first edition of the paper was published in the Elverson Building, an 18-story, 340-foot tall building at Broad and Callow Hill in Philadelphia. He and his wife lived in apartments on the 12th and 13th floors. He died unexpectedly a few weeks before his 60th birthday in his 12th floor apartment in January 1929. The James Elverson Jr. School stands at 13th and Susquehanna. Eleanor Nellie Mayo was born in 1872. She was the daughter of Frank and Mary Bryan Mayo and one of four children. Her father was one of the most distinguished romantic actors of his day. His portrayal of Davy Crockett was beloved by American audiences. Frank Mayo is interred in a mausoleum in West Laurel Hill Cemetery in the Edgewood section. I will do a podcast about actors sometime in 2021. You'll, you'll hear more about him then. Eleanor was a singer, and her initial reviews were promising. In 1893, the New York World reviewed her performance in King Renee's Daughter. The opera served to introduce to the metropolitan audience a young lady, Miss Eleanor Mayo, who, in addition to a really charming voice, fresh, true, and sweet, possesses one of the most attractive personalities seen on the New York stage for a long time. Eleanor's best-known role was as Princess Bonnie in an opera of the same name. In April 1894, she played the role at the Chestnut Street Theater in Philadelphia. The Inquirer critic said, few persons expected anything more than to hear a raw singer murder the part, but she was judged a success. It was during this appearance that she was seen by James Elverson Jr., who was immediately smitten. From the Boston Globe, a beautiful young woman with a beautiful fresh voice. The two seem to go together, each a fitting accompaniment of the other. Youth, beauty, music, all these possessions are realized in the person of Miss Eleanor Mayo, the winsome Princess Bonnie. She was apparently destined for greatness. Until she got a review from Austin Brereton in the national publication, The Illustrated American, in 1894. I am told that she can sing well, but I know that she does not. Of acting, it is plain that she knows nothing. But one should add in fairness that Miss Mayo seldom attempts to act. Sometimes, in the course of an impassioned number, she'll extend first one arm and then the other. Or if the song is of an especially emotional nature, she may extend both arms together. But beyond that, her miming rarely ventures. Anything more stupid, trivial, or inchoate than Princess Bonnie has seldom lingered on the boards after a fortnight's performance. 
a hodgepodge of puerile twaddle and pilfered tunes. But for Miss Mayo, this mere puffball of a comic opera would have promptly disappeared into oblivion. Now, carried along on the breath of her favor, it floats serenely into the dignity of a hundred-night run. At any rate, it is certain that no one has ventured to tell her bluntly, and with kind cruelty, that she cannot sing. In April 1895, Eleanor Mayo married Colonel James Elverson, Jr., and ended her professional singing career. She almost completely disappeared from newspaper reports for the next several decades, except for an occasional appearance as a singer at fundraisers. She assumed the role of spouse of a leader of society, and she played that role very well. Eleanor Mayo Elverson died in her apartments in the tower of the Elverson building at age 57 in April 1929 less than three months after her husband had died in the same apartments. Although the official cause of death was pneumonia, many felt that grief was a factor, as she had not properly recovered from the death of her husband only a few months before. There is no mention of children in either obituary. This is a prominent Philadelphia family, the Furness family. People outside of Philadelphia tend to pronounce it Furness. Uh, one of the members, Frank Furness, whom I will not discuss today, reminded people of the way to pronounce it. He said that he had very red hair and a very bad temper, so think of it as a fiery furnace. In one plot, we have William Henry Furness, one of his sons, Horace Howard Furness, and two of Horace's children, Carolyn Furness Jane and William Henry Furness III, M.D. Their plot is almost hidden under a tree with very flat stones. William Henry Furness was born in Boston, where he developed a lifelong friendship with his schoolmate, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He graduated from Harvard Divinity School in 1823, and at age 22, he became the minister of the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia, where he served until his retirement in 1875, 52 years later. He married Annis P. Jenks of Massachusetts in 1825. They had four children, William Henry Furness, Jr., a portrait painter. He's buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery. Horace Howard Furness, a Shakespeare scholar. Frank Furness, one of Philadelphia's most prominent architects, who's buried in Section S, and I talk about in another podcast about building Philadelphia, and Annis Lee Furness Wister, an author and a translator, who's buried in Section 4. Furness was an ardent abolitionist whose attacks on the Fugitive Slave Act led to a discussion at a cabinet meeting of President James Buchanan about the possibility of indicting him for treason. After Senator Charles Sumner was badly beaten on the floor of the Senate by Congressman Preston Brooks of South Carolina, he stayed at the Furnace home during most of his convalescence. His son Frank was the architect for the 1886 building of his Unitarian Church, which still stands at 22nd and Chestnut. Unlike many Unitarians, Furness was a student of the life of Jesus, about whom he published several books. His simple gravestone does not even contain his whole name, just his initials. Horace Howard Furness was a son of William Henry Furness, brother of architect Frank Furness. He graduated from Harvard University in 1854 and was admitted to the Philadelphia Bar in 1859, but his growing deafness interfered with his practice of the law. In 1860, he joined the Shakespeare Society, spelled S-H-A-K-S-P-E-R-E, -E, the Shakespeare Society of Philadelphia, an amateur study group that took its scholarship very seriously. As editor of the New Variorum Editions of Shakespeare, also called the Furnace Variorum, he collected in a single source 
300 years of references, antecedent works, influences, and commentaries. He devoted more than 40 years to this series, completing the annotation of 16 plays. He was also the advisor for doctoral student Emily Jordan Folger, who with her husband, Henry Clay Folger, would co-found the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. He kept a skull on his desk, which was used as Yorick in local productions of Hamlet. The skull belonged to John Reed, a stagehand at the Walnut Street Theater, who made a deathbed request that his skull be used in this manner. The skull has been autographed by virtually all famed 19th century actors who played the role. Both William McCready and Edwin Forrest, who were mortal enemies, Edwin Booth, Edmund Keane, Charlotte Cushman, and many others. Furness High School in South Philadelphia is named for him. His entire library is preserved on the sixth floor of the Van Pelt Library on the University of Pennsylvania campus. It had initially been part of the Furness Library, designed by his brother, Frank. Like his father, Horace Howard Furness is interred in the family plot with a marker showing only his initials. Carolyn Furness was the youngest of four children and the only daughter of Horace Howard Furness and his wife, author Helen Kate Rogers Furness. Carolyn graduated from the Agnes Irvin School, the most famous girls' school in town. It was founded by a, the great-great-granddaughter of Benjamin Franklin. In 1894, she married Horace Jane, a physician and biology professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He was 14 years her senior. In 1884, he had been appointed professor of vertebrate morphology at the Wistar Institute of Anatomy and Biology. While Horace Jane was building his reputation as a scholar and scientist, Carolyn was interested in ethnology. She became the world authority on string figures, designs formed by manipulating string on, around, and using one's fingers or sometimes between the fingers of many people. You know it as Cat's Cradle. It is a universal game played among all civilizations and dating back thousands of years. In 1906, Scribner's published her masterpiece, String Figures and How to Make Them, a study of Cat's Cradle in Many Lands. This ur-text contains literally hundreds of drawings and photographs of string games from around the world. You can find this text online for free at stringfigures.info. In spring 1909, Carolyn contracted typhoid fever and faded rapidly. Her brother, a physician, courageously volunteered to donate blood, which at that time was dangerous for both donor and recipient. It was unsuccessful, and Carolyn Furness Jane died in June 1909 at age 35. She was memorialized in her grandfather's church with a stained glass window, which you can see today at the First Unitarian Church. She has a modest flat tombstone in the style of her father and her grandfather with just her initials and those of her husband along with the dates of birth and death. Carolyn's brother, William Henry Furness III, attended St. Paul's School, Harvard University, and graduated from the University of Pennsylvania Medical School in 1891. He was one of the medical students portrayed in the Thomas Eakins 1889 painting, The Agnew Clinic. Upper row with his head tilted. Furness made four expeditions to Southeast Asia and Oceania between 1895 and 1901. He collected ethnographic, archaeological, and skeletal material. These artifacts were among the founding collections of the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, which is a superb museum, by the way. If you are a Philadelphian and have not visited, you need to. If you're from out of town, put that on your list when you come to Philadelphia. In 1903, he returned to the South Pacific 
and spent two months among the Wab people on the island of Yap. He wrote about their use of rye stones, donut-shaped limestone discs, as money. During his travels, William Henry Furness III became one of the most heavily tattooed men in the world. He never married. He lived at Lindenshade, his parents' house in Wallingford. He provided some of the illustrations for his sister's book on string games. During World War I, he served as a captain in the U.S. Army Medical Corps and organized distribution of medical supplies. He donated the land for the Helen Kate Furness Free Library in Wallingford, named for his mother. He died in August 1920 at age 54. He too has a simple stone, but at least his full name is on it. This is another family that I could talk about for a very long time, the Bolin family. They're located not that far outside the shrubbery near the burial place of Mercy Carlisle, the first person buried at Laurel Hill Cemetery in 1836. John Bolin came to the United States in 1790. He purchased half of the land for the family plot in 1838, just two years after the cemetery opened. In 1840, he bought a contiguous plot. The total amount he paid was $195.29. This is his original deed. It's on file at the archives in the office and is signed by three of the four founders of the cemetery. John Bolden was involved in the import business. His primary products were gin and indentured servants. This excerpt from George Washington's personal expense book while he was living in Philadelphia shows a payment to Mr. Bolin for a boy and two women. When Avis Bolin was leaving her career in the State Department in 2003, she gave an exit interview, which you can find online. She flat out states that the family fortune came from the slave trade. There are enough Bolins to spend at least an hour on. I will limit my comments to just a handful. This is Francis Herman Bolin, grandson of John. He was renowned professor of law at Penn, serving as the Algernon Sidney Biddle Professor of Law. When he died in 1942, his memorial in the UPenn Law Journal was full of, let's say, backhanded compliments. When we think of him, we think of the modern American law of torts. He despised mediocrity and made short shrift of the stupid student. If you wish to pause here and read about how he brought his classroom to a roar of laughter, you may do so, but I will not read this. Margaret Alwina Bolin went to school in Chestnut Hill. She was apparently a wild child as you can see from this 1922 write-up in the Washington Times. One of the pretty and popular girls who plays around with the diplomatic set. She married Colonel Elijah Francis Riggs, 13 years her senior. She went with him to Puerto Rico when he was appointed police chief on the island. On the 24th of October, 1935, a student assembly at Rio Piedras University was broken up by police firing into a crowd of students killing four of them, the Rio Piedras Massacre. Riggs was blamed. Four months later, Riggs was assassinated while returning from mass. His assassins were captured and executed by the police without a trial. Riggs was buried in Puerto Rico. There is a very nice Wikipedia page about the Rio Piedras Massacre. Alwina returned to the United States and lived in New York City where a year later she suddenly died of appendicitis. She was 37 years old. Henry Morgan Buffy Bolin went to St. Paul's School, where he was, quote, the greatest distinction jointly in scholarship and athletics, end quote, in the school's history. He was a heavy drinker, however. He committed suicide at age 32. Charles Eustace Chip Bolin, 
was partially named for his grandfather, James Biddle Eustace, ambassador to France under Grover Cleveland. His mother, Celestine, spent her entire life as a confirmed Francophile. Chip was expelled from St. Paul's for playing a game of football in the hallways using an inflated condom as the ball. Nonetheless, he managed to matriculate at Harvard. In 1929, he joined the State Department and he learned Russian. He became very fluent. He was in Tokyo on 7 December 1941, and it took him nearly six months to be released back to the United States. He became the personal Russian interpreter for Franklin Roosevelt, serving at the Tehran Conference in 1943 and at Yalta in 1945. He went on to serve with Harry Truman also, and whom you see here with Joseph Stalin. He was partially blamed for the handover of much of Central and Eastern Europe to Russia at the end of World War II. His service to the country is very well covered in this book by Walter Isaacson, The Wise Man, which I highly recommend. This is one of the best books on contemporary American history that I've read in the last several years. The complexities of his career are too much to cover here. But when he was nominated to serve as ambassador to Russia in 1954, he was fought by Senator Joe McCarthy, who thought that he knew too much about Russia, and this should disqualify him. As you see, he also has a U.S. postage stamp. After serving as ambassador to the Philippines, he was appointed ambassador to France in 1962 by John F. Kennedy. His wife, Avis, became as well known as him. The Avis Bolin Award is given annually to the family member of a State Department ambassador who has done the most to improve international relations with the United States. When Bolin died in 1974 in Washington, D.C., his remains were cremated and placed in the family vault. For his place in world history, Chip Bolin has a modest inscription on the family stone, and you have to walk around back to even see it. Now, for many years, the Bolin family has kept the tomb decorated with frogs. When asked, they only say cryptically, Grandma liked frogs. That would be Celestine. I will leave it to you to determine the connections between France and the decorations. Chip's daughter, Avis, followed him into the diplomatic corps, served as ambassador to Bulgaria from 1996 to 1999. She turned 80 earlier this year. She lives in Villanova. So this family plot purchased in 1838 is still active and maintained by family members. Old Bolin had two sons worthy of mention, but they are interred in a separate plot. Brigadier General Heinrich Henry Bolin is one of Laurel Hill Cemetery's 40-some general officers from the Civil War, third only to Arlington National Cemetery and West Point. He was born in Germany. He was the first foreign-born general in the Union Army. In August 1862, Henry was killed at age 51 while pursuing Stonewall Jackson at Rappahannock Station. His funeral oration was 16 pages long and included phrases like the mutilated and wasted remains of a personal friend, a Christian brother, a patriotic citizen, and a distinguished soldier. Only his dissolving body returns to us. We cannot look upon him anymore. After his death, his daughter Sophie moved back to Germany and married Gustav von Bolen und Halbach a member of German aristocracy. Their son, Gustav, Henry's grandson, was a diplomat pushed by the Kaiser to marry Bertha Krupp in 1906. Bertha's father, Friedrich Alfred Krupp, was the sole proprietor of Krupp Manufacturing, who committed suicide in 1902 when he was caught in a homosexual scandal. Bertha inherited the company but there was no way that this teenager would be allowed to run this manufacturing juggernaut. Gustav stepped in and took over. 
The Krupps apparently had a loving relationship despite a 16 year age difference. He even named the siege howitzer after her, Big Bertha. Krupp manufactured most of the armaments used by Germany during both world wars and became a favorite of Adolf Hitler's. After the war, he was accused of being a war criminal, but he was determined to be too feeble to undergo a trial. He lived for five years after the war and is buried in Germany. Henry's brother, John, was a lawyer who died after he was thrown from a horse while riding in Fairmount Park. Let's take a stretch break here. I'll give you a few seconds. You can stop. You can empty your bladder. You can grab something to drink, whatever you need to do. And we'll come back and talk about another armaments expert from a completely different war. Next up, the Dahlgren family, Admiral John Adolphus Dahlgren and his son, Colonel Ulrich Dahlgren. You can hear a lot more about the Dahlgrens in podcast number 10, Friends of Abraham Lincoln. They were buried not too far from General Meade. From childhood, John Dahlgren knew that he wanted to be a naval hero. At the time, the only way to rise in the ranks was to be in battle. Dahlgren unintentionally changed the rules. In 1834, he was assigned to the United States Coastal Survey, then under the wise guidance of the amazing Swiss immigrant Ferdinand Hassler, buried in Section P. I plan to talk about Hassler and his family when I get around to doing a second hot spots tour sometime in the next few months. Under Hassler's watchful eye, Dahlgren learned the scientific method. He made a name for himself with his careful methodology, meticulous measurements, and writings accepted as gospel by many men his senior in rank. Until this time, science was rarely used in the development of Navy ordnance. It was mostly knowledge passed down from master to apprentice, and a little was known about the metallurgy involved to make reliable weapons. John Dahlgren was assigned to the Washington Navy Yard, and between 1847 and 1850, he invented and developed the gun that bears his name, the Dahlgren gun, using only scientific principles and careful experimentation. In April 1861, just as the war started, he found himself in charge of the Washington Navy Yard. All of his senior officers had resigned to go south and joined the Confederate Navy. The next month, Dahlgren met Abraham Lincoln at a concert at the Navy Yard, and they struck up a friendship. Lincoln liked gadgets, and Dahlgren was the king of naval gadgets. Both men were teetotalers, but Lincoln came almost weekly to sit, drink coffee, smoke cigars, and discuss the events of the day with his new friend. And Lincoln's door at the White House was always open to his friend Dahlgren, much to the chagrin of many senior Navy officers and Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells. Despite having no combat experience, Lincoln promoted Dahlgren to Admiral in March 1863. He became known as Lincoln's Admiral. After he died in 1870, the Navy honored him by giving his name to three ships, a building at the Naval Academy, a building in a street at the Washington Navy Yard, and a naval weapons proving ground in Virginia. A bust of Dahlgren clad in a toga now stands in Dahlgren Hall at the Naval Academy. John's son Ulrich Dahlgren grew up at the Washington Naval Shipyard. Naval cannons were his toys. Active sailors were his early teachers and friends. He had free run of the Ordnance Department. In 1862, when he was 20, Ulrich gave a personal report to Lincoln about his observations of naval artillery units setting up defensive lines around Washington. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton was present, was so impressed that he immediately granted Ulrich a direct commission as an aide-de-camp with the rank of captain. A couple of days after the Battle of Gettysburg, on July 6th, 1863, Ulrich took a small body of men to harass the enemy's rear columns as they retreated. 
he was shot in the foot at Hagerstown, Maryland. Surgeons removed the bullet and bone fragments, but he worsened and lapsed into a coma. Secretary Stanton promoted him to colonel, thinking he would never live to wear the eagles. Surgeons finally agreed the only hope for survival was in amputating his leg below the knee. They did, and he got better. He awoke, and he took the oath of his new rank and was out of danger in August. Three months after the amputation, Ulrich was back in the saddle with a high-quality prosthesis and looking for another command, this time as the youngest colonel in the Union Army. He was 21 years old. On March 2nd, 1864, Dahlgren was killed during a failed raid to capture Richmond, Virginia, and free Union soldiers incarcerated at Libby Prison in Richmond. Papers purportedly found on his body showed that Dahlgren's orders included the assassination of Jefferson Davis and all Confederate cabinet members. Until this time, civilian leaders were considered off limits, but the South became furious. General Meade said he had given no such orders, and rumors circulated that the papers were counterfeit. Dahlgren's body was dumped in a shallow grave without ceremony for months. The South would not allow it to be repatriated to the North. It was eventually done so after he was identified on a moonless night by the recovery team reaching into the coffin to confirm that the corpse was missing a right leg. But the rules of warfare had now changed. John Wilkes Booth was infuriated by what he heard about this so-called Dahlgren affair and took this transgression of the rules of war as permission to assassinate the head of the Union, Abraham Lincoln. The Hagerstown, Maryland minor league baseball team celebrated Dahlgren with a bobblehead doll a few years ago. It shows him as a captain as he still has both of his legs. As far as we know, the editress Sarah Josepha Hale, baseball announcer Harry Callis, and Ulrich Dahlgren are the only three Laurel Hill Cemetery residents to have their own bobblehead dolls. Ulrich Dahlgren is buried under a very simple stone next to his father. What happened to his leg, both the amputated one and the prosthesis, is each another story. Check out my podcast from February 2020. FOAL, Friends of Abraham Lincoln, to learn more about Admiral John Dahlgren and his son, Colonel Ulrich Dahlgren. There are 12 markers in the Wiener family plot. It is located in section J. There's a nice obelisk in the middle of the markers, and there are 13 people buried there. The only one we are going to talk about is Clarence L. Weiner. He does not have a marker. Clarence was born in 1878. His father, Edward, died when he was 16. He went to Harvard, but for only one year, 1896 to 1897. He did not graduate. He is best remembered for having a collection of taxidermized wildlife in his dormitory room. After a student celebration one night, he roused his fellow dormitory residents by peppering his stuffed lion with a repeating rifle. In 1898, Clarence had an article published in the December issue of North American Review. It was called Financial Wrong in Puerto Rico. He was in good company. The same issue had articles by Theodore Roosevelt, Reverend Lyman Abbott, Commodore George Wallace Melville, who's buried in Laurel Hill Cemetery, Section 10, and Lieutenant Winston Spencer Churchill. In 1899, Clarence's mother remarried a concert violinist. No one knew where Clarence was, so he did not attend the wedding. This marriage caused a little bit of a scandal in Philadelphia newspapers with that headline, Mrs. Lewis Weiner's Latest Husband. In 1904, Clarence mysteriously reappeared in Philadelphia after having not been heard of for several years. He said he was a captain, although it was unclear 
which army he was part of. Despite only spending one year at Harvard, he was faithful about keeping his former mates from the class of 1900 informed about all of his adventures. His submission for the 1915 class summary is rather staggering. I have highlighted the points here. I went to Puerto Rico as first lieutenant and aide de camp on General F.D. Grant's staff. In 1899 in November, I went to South Africa as correspondent for the New York Sun. I was offered eight commissions in the next few days. I was eight times wounded and in January 1901 had an independent command of 340 men. I had 36 polo ponies in Rome, where I started polo. In the spring of 1904, I drove tandem and three extra horses 2,000 miles through Europe from Rome. From 1905 to 1908, I was engaged in Vienna in perfecting an electric self-player piano that I had invented. At the same time, I became president of Broadway Magazine, renamed Hamptons Magazine, in 1908. In the spring of 1908, I had a houseboat, 100 by 19 feet, finished after two years building on the Danube, etc., etc., etc. He told wonderful stories. During the above time, I have been chairman of the following companies, etc., etc. In August 1915, I became the accredited war correspondent of Reuters Telegram Company Limited and the Press Association Limited of London. Does this remind you of somebody in history? I believe he is Baron Munchausen of Laurel Hill Cemetery. Then there was the 1908 auto accident, which made headlines both in Europe and in the United States. His dead passenger was one of the infamous Barrison sisters, from a risque vaudeville act which performed in the United States and Europe in the 1890s. In the US, they were advertised as the wickedest girls in the world. The five blonde and curly-headed siblings were said to sing in high squeaky voices and dance with middling ability. They achieved notoriety, however, by the ingenious use of double entendre on stage. They would tease the audience, by offering to show them a certain part of their anatomy and then lifting their voluminous dresses to reveal a cat perched strategically in a pocket at groin level. I will say no more than that. You can see in the picture here. Rumors flew that Clarence and the dead sister, now known as Mamselle Betin, were driving to London to be wed, but she was still married to a rich Chilean whom she had not yet divorced. In 1914, Wiener got into a spat with Harvard over one of their professors, Hugo Munsterberg, who had brought out a book and written several articles since the war began that defended Germany and the Kaiser and denounced England, France, and Russia as being the blame for the war. Clarence fired off a telegram threatening to cancel his bequest of $10 million to Harvard if Professor Munsterberg was not released from the faculty for unwarranted pro-German utterances. Philadelphia newspapers went to his relatives who said, Clarence has made some money, but he has had several ups and downs. I couldn't swear that he has more than two cents. Munsterberg offered his resignation, Harvard declined, and everything seemed to settle down. He had purchased Ewell Castle outside of Epsom and made it his home for several years. During the Great War, he was accused of being a German spy, primarily because he owned an 80 horsepower car equipped with a 500 candle power acetylene searchlight. He sued the local newspaper for libel and he won a Pyrrhic victory of 75 pounds. He refused to testify in his own defense as he would have been questioned about the large number of lady visitors from the town to which he motored daily. After the war, he moved back to the United States. In 1919, he left the Waldorf Astoria in New York, not having paid the bill, and checked into the Hotel Imperial. 
There, on the 15th of December, he shot himself just below the heart, leaving a suicide note on a stationery of the Wiener Advertising Agency. The shot was not fatal. He would recover. Adding insult to injury, Clarence was arrested in his hospital room on the 18th of December for violating the Sullivan Act with illegal possession of a firearm. For a man with such a gift for self-promotion, he was surprisingly camera shy. The only photo I could find was this passport photo from 1922. He disappears for the next several years until 22 November 1932. He registered at the Hotel Taft in New York City on 11 November as Colonel Wiener of Philadelphia. But 11 days later, he took a sash cord down from the window, wrapped it around his neck, and hanged himself from a hook in the closet of his room on the seventh floor. His newspaper death notice acknowledged, although admittedly a student of military matters, Wiener's rank and military career were somewhat mysterious. In recent years, he had been known as Colonel Wiener. Older newspaper clippings describing some of his exploits listed him as Captain Wiener and Major Wiener, but he was not listed in the Army Register. His family took him into the plot, and he was interred four days after his death, but there is no marker to indicate that he is there. Biddle is a very common name in Philadelphia and at Laurel Hill Cemetery. There are more than a hundred people with a middle or last name of Biddle at Laurel Hill. I'm going to talk about Captain Henry Biddle, his wife, Mary Baird Biddle, his son, Lieutenant Jonathan Biddle, and another son, Spencer Fullerton Baird Biddle. They have one of the prettiest plots in the cemetery. It's at an area called Key Point. It's right across from the empty Craig plot that I talked about earlier. Henry Biddle was the son of Thomas Biddle. His grandfather, Clement Biddle, was an American Revolutionary War soldier who helped organize the Quaker Blues Volunteers. Henry attended West Point, but did not graduate. He married his distant cousin, Mary, 12 years his junior, and they had four children together. When the Civil War started, he was commissioned a captain of volunteers. During the June 30th, 1862 Battle of Glendale, he came too close to the Confederate lines and was wounded by a volley from the 47th Virginia Infantry. Captain Biddle was taken to the Chimborazo Hospital in Richmond, probably the largest military hospital in the world at the time. Although severely wounded, he was expected to recover. He dictated the letter to his brother, which was shared with his wife. He was supposed to visit home on parole when he healed. The Philadelphia Inquirer incorrectly noted that he had been killed. They put in a correction. and They said their earlier report of his death was greatly exaggerated. Biddle came under the care of a Virginia physician, Dr. Edwin Harvey Smith. They actually struck up a friendship. Despite good care, he worsened. In a letter dated July 20th, 1862, addressed to Mary, Henry writes, I have fought the battle of life as hard as I could but I feel that I am now going. I write to bless you and all my dear children. Good night. May God bless you. That evening he died, 20 days after being injured. In 1865, with the war over, Mrs. Biddle purchased a silver pitcher and had it engraved, I was sick and you came on to me. She sent the pitcher to Dr. Smith's home in Richmond. One of the missions of Reconstruction was to educate the newly freed enslaved people. In 1867, news of a fundraising effort to found the Freedmen's College of North Carolina reached Mary Biddle's congregation in Philadelphia. Her response was to pledge $1,400 toward the founding of the school. It was named Biddle University, a name it would carry from 1867 until 1921 when it received its current name of Johnson C. Smith University. In 1883, the main academic and administrative building of the school was dedicated as Biddle Hall, an imposing neo-Gothic academic hall that still stands.
Jonathan Biddle attended Princeton University, graduating in June 1876. He settled out west shortly after graduation. Possibly inspired by the Battle of Little Bighorn in June 1876, he applied to General Grant for a commission in the regular army. And on the 31st of August, 1876, he was appointed a second lieutenant in the 7th Regiment, U.S. Cavalry. He went straight into active service. The Battle of Bear Paw began on September 30th, 1877. There is a superb narrative about this encounter in the book, Napier's Summer, 1877, The U.S. Army and the Nimi Poo Crisis. This is available online for free from this Earl. I will leave this up for a few seconds. This is a partial account of the battle. Captain Owen Hale ordered his men to dismount and to move forward in skirmish formation. Their shooting forcing the Napiers from their position below the bluff embankment from which they had fired on companies A and D. In the exchange, Lieutenant Biddle was one of the first casualties killed by Napier's fire, according to one witness, while in the act of kneeling to shoot. Unit commander wrote, I was shocked to see the lifeless body of that accomplished officer and thorough gentleman, Hale, lying upon the crest of a little knoll with his white charger beside him. A little further was the body of the young and spirited Biddle. It was at this final surrender of the Napiers when Chief Joseph wearily gave his legendary speech, Hear me, my chiefs, I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. Jonathan Biddle has a beautiful grave with the symbols of his cavalry rank on top. Spencer Fullerton Baird Biddle was born in Philadelphia in 1859. He was named for his uncle, Spencer Fullerton Baird, the second curator of the Smithsonian Institution. He graduated from the Naval Academy in 1878 at the age of 19, and he served two years in the Mediterranean. He resigned his commission and headed where anyone who loved the water would go, to Montana. In 1881, Biddle, now known as S.F.B. Biddle, bought a 400-acre ranch at the mouth of Horse Creek on the Powder River in Montana Territory. In 1885, Biddle became one of the first members of the powerful Montana Stock Growers Association. He was also a representative from Custer County, which at that time encompassed all of southeastern Montana, to the 1885 Cowboy Legislature. He was an inventor. He designed and patented the Biddle Tent, a one-man shelter that someone could use on the range. Some of his employees worked for him for the entire 34 years that he ranched in Montana. He referred to the Powder River country as his elixir of life. The town of Biddle, Montana is named for him. When the Spanish-American War started, he re-enlisted. He served on the USS Fishhawk and was honorably discharged in October 1898. After leaving the ranch, he and his wife moved to Paris and became part of the smart set. In 1913, he and several other expatriates living in Paris, including J. Pierpont Morgan, incorporated the American Hospital of Paris, designed specifically to care for U.S. citizens who found themselves in need of medical care in the City of Light. This hospital still exists. When the World War broke out in 1914, the 55-year-old tried to re-enlist, but he was turned down because of blindness in one eye and a heart condition. Since he spoke fluent French, he ended up serving Navy intelligence in Paris. Spencer F. B. Biddle died in Paris April 1, 1929, at age 70. He and his wife were brought from Paris and interred in the family plot at Laurel Hill Cemetery on the 1st of May, 1929. Thomas Sully and his family have a lot to talk about.
I'm going to mention two of his daughters, Blanche and Rosalie, one of his sons, General Alfred Sully, and then a great granddaughter who is not buried here, but I just want to spend a couple of seconds talking about her. They are buried in section A, lot 41. There is a massive gopher hole right next to the obelisk. So when you visit, be very careful. It will swallow your leg up to your knee. Born in England, Thomas Sully settled in Philadelphia in 1806 at the age of 23. He primarily painted portraits. By the time of his death in 1872, he had produced more than 2,600 paintings. You would know him from his 1828 portrait of Andrew Jackson, which was the basis for Jackson's picture on the American $20 bill since 1928. When his elder brother Lawrence Sully died in 1804, Thomas married his brother's widow, Sarah. He took on the rearing of Lawrence's children, and he and Sarah had an additional nine children together. The Passage of the Delaware is his large oil. It's exhibited in the Museum of Fine Arts at Boston. It is 12 feet high by 17 and a quarter feet wide. It spent more than a hundred years in storage before recently being redisplayed. That is a story in and of itself. Sully liked to paint famous people. He portrayed Thomas Jefferson at least eight times. In fact, if you go to Monticello, the portrait of Jefferson that you see when you walk in the door of the house is a Sully portrait. He loved painting beautiful women even more. This is British actress Frances Fanny Kemble, grandmother of author and lawyer Owen Wister, who's buried in Section J at Laurel Hill Cemetery. She was a favorite subject of his. In 1837, he accepted an invitation to do a portrait of Princess Alexandrina Victoria of Kent. But before he could get to England and the painting could start, Victoria's uncle, King William IV, died, and she ascended to the throne where she would serve for more than 60 years and inspire and oversee what we now know as the Victorian era. One of Sully's daughters, Blanche, accompanied him to London. The new queen, of course, had no time to sit for a complete formal portrait. Thomas painted her face from life and then put Blanche in the royal crown and robes for the remaining of the painting. As far as we know, she is the only American ever to wear this royal accoutrement. We are used to seeing photos of Victoria as an older, rather dowdy, dumpy dowager. Sully's 1838 painting shows otherwise. She was a beautiful young woman, literally portrayed as ascending to the throne on steps and looking back over her right shoulder. This is a stunning portrait. Another favorite actress was Charlotte Cushman, whom he painted as far more attractive than she really was in real life. Cushman specialized in playing men's roles. Cushman seduced another of Sully's daughters, Rosalie. In 1844, Rosalie noted in her journal that she and Cushman were married. The next year, Cushman deserted Rosalie for a European tour, and Rosalie faded away dying in 1847 at age 29, her own budding painting career cut short. Her father painted her from memory the year after she died. Locally, you can see several of Thomas Sully's works at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, Independence Hall, the Hill Physic House, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Thomas's palette, easel, and paintbrushes are maintained at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. Born in 1820, Thomas's son Alfred Sully attended West Point, where his 1841 classmates included Don Carlos Buell, John Reynolds, and Schuyler Hamilton. Alfred pursued his military career with assignments in Mexico, the Plains States, and the California Territory. In 1846, he served under General Winfield Scott at the Battle of Tampico. 
After sailing around the Cape, he settled in Monterey, California in 1849. A significant year in California's history, of course. While out west, he lived with Spanish nobleman Don Manuel de Guerra and fell in love with his teenage daughter, Donna Manuela. The couple's elopement to marry is thought to be the first elopement in California history. Alfred planned to resign his commission to be an artist and dedicated family man. But in 1851, Donna Manuela presented him with a son and then died a short time later of cholera. His grief deepened a few weeks later when his mother-in-law, who had been serving as wet nurse, accidentally smothered the child in her sleep. Alfred stayed busy in the army. He eventually rose to the rank of brigadier general. In 1862, he was assigned leadership of the 1st Minnesota, but was removed from command when he refused to put down a mutiny among volunteers who had served their two-year terms and wished to be relieved of duty. Although he was not court-martialed, he was banished out west for the remainder of the war. The 1st Minnesota suffered 82% casualties at Gettysburg. His career as an Indian fighter was mixed. He led several slaughters of Native Americans, but came to respect the Sioux tribes where he was assigned, even married a daughter of one of the tribal leaders of the Yankton Sioux. It is said that she reminded him of his late Mexican wife. His daughter, Mary, known as Soldier Woman, married Reverend Philip Joseph Deloria, also known as Black Lodge, a leader of the Yankton Sioux. Among their descendants are Vine Deloria Jr., author of Custer Died for Your Sins, and someone else I will mention in a moment. Alfred died at Fort Vancouver, Washington Territory in 1879 at age 58, seven years after his father. Thomas, Alfred, Rosalie, and Blanche are buried together in the family plot, Section A, in the north part of Laurel Hill Cemetery. This is Mary Sully. She was Alfred Sully's granddaughter and Thomas Sully's great-granddaughter. She was a Native American artist whose work was pretty much ignored during her lifetime. She has been rediscovered in the 21st century. Her biography, Becoming Mary Sully, was published in 2019 by her grandnephew, Philip Deloria. She is buried in South Dakota. And now we come to my favorite person at Laurel Hill Cemetery, Monsignor Cyril Sigourney Webster Fay. We will talk about his father, his mother, and his brother-in-law just a little bit. They are buried right at the corner there, uh, not far from the Fittler Obelisk, the tallest in Laurel Hill Cemetery, and the unmarked grave of a woman named Indiana Jones. Yes, we really do have an Indiana Jones at Laurel Hill Cemetery. L. Ford Fay was born and raised in Boston. He entered the military in November 1861 at age 18. When he was mustered out in October 1865, he was a captain. After the war, he worked in textiles with his older brother at the firm of Wendell Fay and Company, which handled woolen goods. He was the Philadelphia representative. Captain Fay died in Philadelphia in 1881. His son, Sigourney, was still a young schoolboy. Suzanne Hutchinson Fay came from an old line Philadelphia Episcopalian family around since revolutionary times. After her husband died in 1881, she never remarried. In 1907, she moved to Wynwood on the main line. Fay's family was very well off. They mixed with Philadelphia society. They had a beautiful large home at the New Jersey shore. Also in 1907, her daughter, Mary Forbes Fay, married a dentist, Andrew Swanton Burke. They followed Suzanne to Wynwood. Dr. Burke was a devout Episcopalian. He began holding vespers in his home, and a small Episcopalian congregation grew. Burke's mother-in-law encouraged him to study for the priesthood and made him a promise she would build him a church when he graduated. She did. 
All Saints Episcopal Church still stands on Montgomery Avenue in Wynwood. And Reverend Burke died in 1919 of a perforated ulcer. Susanna outlived not only her husband, but her son and her son-in-law. Sigourney Webster Fay was six years old when his father died. He attended Penn, where he was involved in theater. The May 7, 1899 Philadelphia Times mentions Fay in their write-up of a presentation of Elizabethan playwright John Fletcher's The Tamer Tamed. Quote, Sigourney W. Fay is well known in collegiate circles as one possessing considerable histrionic ability. His impersonation of Mrs. Malaprop in Sheridan's masterpiece, which was given with great success a year or two ago, was received with much appreciation. End quote. Faye was noted as playing the role of Maria, daughter of Petronius and second wife of Petruchio. After graduating from Penn, Sigourney entered the Episcopal Divinity School to study for the priesthood. He was ordained in 1903. Father Fay became professor of dogmatic and moral theology at Neshota House, a conservative Episcopal seminary in Wisconsin. There he joined a group of Anglican clergymen called the Companions of the Holy Savior. And in 1907, during the American Oxford movement, he dropped out of the Episcopalian church. He converted to Catholicism in 1908. When he converted to Catholicism, he took the new name Cyril. This was due to his interest in Eastern Orthodox Catholicism also. He was ordained in the Baltimore Archdiocese by Cardinal James Gibbons in 1910. Whenever he was not away teaching or on assignment, he lived with Cardinal Gibbons. Father Fay only briefly worked as a parish priest. He was too much in demand as a retreat master and a preacher. He was appointed headmaster of the Newman School for Boys in Hackensack, New Jersey. He may have labored there unknown beyond his students, but for a troubled youth from Minnesota, who was doing poorly at St. Paul's Academy in St. Paul. Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald, better known as F. Scott, was born in 1896. He was not close to his father and his mother was rather overbearing. His parents heard about the Newman School and shipped him off to New Jersey in 1911 when he was 15 years old. Fitzgerald met Father Fay in his second year and was absolutely awestruck. He had never met anyone like him. They took an instant liking to each other, replacing Edward Fitzgerald as a father figure. When Fitzgerald moved east, Sigourney Fay was the most important adult in Fitzgerald's life during his high school, college, and military experience. Fitzgerald's biographers described Fay as a fin de siècle esthete of considerable appeal, a dandy, always heavily perfumed who introduced the teenage Fitzgerald to the writings of Oscar Wilde and Good Wine, a man of irresistibly infectious charm who loved to gossip and tell stories, which he punctuated with high-pitched giggles. Fitzgerald called him the most romantic character I have ever met. Father Fay and Fitzgerald developed an intense relationship, but although they parted after only one year, they wrote long, deeply revealing letters to each other for the rest of the priest's life. Fitzgerald revealed his feelings in paradise when describing the first meeting of Amory Blaine and Monsignor Thayer Darcy. They slipped briskly into an intimacy from which they never recovered. Fitzgerald went on to study at Princeton, where he encountered senior golden boy Hobart Amory Hare Hobie Baker, who died in 1918 and is interred at West Laurel Hill Cemetery. I refer you again to podcast number 19, 
the other side of paradise for far more complete biographies of both Monsignor Fay and Hobie Baker. When Fitzgerald published his first novel, This Side of Paradise, in 1920, it was dedicated to Sigourney Fay, with his name misspelled. The main character, Amory Blaine, was based on Fitzgerald himself, taking one of the family names of sports hero Hobie Baker. The godlike football hero Allenby was based on Hobie, and the character of Monsignor Thayer Darcy was Father Sigourney Fay. Many of the letters in the book between Amory and the Monsignor are practically copied word for word from letters between Fitzgerald and Fay. Unfortunately, the records of the Newman School have been lost. Most of the Fay Fitzgerald correspondence was burned after the Monsignor's death. Father Fay's family societal connections allowed him to live a rather plush life, even as a religious. Society Catholic Mrs. Winthrop Margaret Louisa Daisy Terry Chandler wrote in her 1936 book, Autumn in the Valley, about Father Fay's visits to their country home, Sweetbriar. She said he was one of those guests who know how to make the waters bubble and sparkle. He was a learned man with much of the delightful child about him. He combined spiritual with temporal gifts, for he preached admirably and could bring fire from heaven to kindle the hearts of his hearers, but he was no ascetic and dearly loved good company, good food, and drink. Among the people that Faye befriended were Franz Liszt, Theodore Roosevelt, and especially Henry Adams, who called for Faye on his deathbed in 1918. When Daisy Chandler wrote her autobiography in 1936, she spent several pages discussing father, then Monsignor Fay. She describes a game of role-playing the priest played with her children. Father Fay and the children would occasionally get up charades. I remember a scene late in the Vatican. The Germans were preparing to capture Rome. Lord and Lady Aberdeen had an audience with the Pope and persuaded His Holiness that it was his duty to escape. Father Fay was exceedingly fat. He played the part of the Pope, acting it with great gusto. The Holy Father was terribly frightened. How could he leave the Vatican? The thing was unthinkable. Everyone would recognize him, would intercept his flight. He would probably be killed. Lady Aberdeen had an inspiration. She would lend him her clothes, a fine silver gown she had made to wear at a garden party at Buckingham Palace. The idea appealed to him, and the thing was done. But how describe dear Father Fay's appearance disguised as Lady Aberdeen in a curious silver brocade garment from Morocco? It looked very incongruous with his large Florentine hat trimmed with roses and blue ribbons flopping over his round face and spectacled blue eyes. When the United States joined the World War, Fay immediately volunteered for the Red Cross and was assigned the rank of major. His travels took him to Rome and Vatican City, where he immediately became friends with Pope Benedict XV. Before returning stateside on a mission for the Pope, he made him a Monsignor. He visited the Chandlers once again, this time with a vast trunk of his Monsignoral uniforms, and showed off his ecclesiastical finery with childish glee. Again, this is from Autumn in the Valley. But you have not seen what I wear on state occasions at the Vatican. He bounced from his seat and upstairs. Like other fat people I have known, he was very light on his feet and moved with the specific gravity of a toy balloon that has come down but barely touches the earth. He appeared again, glorious in rustling purple-pink Ferra Aulo over a purple cassock of a heavier silk picked out with bright red pipings and carmine buttons and a fine purple pink beretta the effect was quite dazzling as the happy man paraded up and down the sunny terrace he looked like nothing so much as an enormous peony floating about on the hot bricks Again, from this side of paradise, 
Monsignor was 44 then, and bustling, a trifle too stout for symmetry, with hair the color of spun gold and a brilliant enveloping personality. When he came into a room clad in his full purple regalia from thatch to toe, he resembled a Turner sunset and attracted both admiration and attention. If you want to know what a Turner sunset looks like, that's it. Cardinal Gibbons again assigned him to an overseas project in the Vatican in 1919. He first went to New York to preach at a retreat. But on the eve of his sailing for London, he was stricken with influenza right at the tail end of that epidemic, and he died. Monsignor Sigourney Fay was 43 years old. He had taken the name Cyril when he converted to Catholicism as his Christian name. For the rest of his life, he alternated between using Cyril and Sigourney. Now, there is some controversy about whether Monsignor Fay was gay. We don't have time to explore it here. Check out the podcast. I make a few more comments about it there. We do know that F. Scott Fitzgerald was a homophobe. His opinion of Monsignor Darcy was that, quote, he loved the idea of God enough to be a celibate. We will also not get into the family dynamics of the burial plot. Many of Faye's sermons and essays were gathered and published a few years after his death. The Bride of the Lamb and other essays. Fitzgerald did not forget his mentor after Paradise. When he wrote The Great Gatsby, his female protagonist was Daisy Faye Buchanan. Daisy from Mrs. Chandler and Faye from his mentor. As an aside, Susan Alexandra Weaver was born in 1949, the only daughter of English actress Elizabeth Inglis and American television executive Sylvester Pat Weaver, who was president of NBC between 1953 and 1955. She thought the name Susan was not appropriate for somebody who was five feet, 10 inches tall when she was 14 years old. She had just read The Great Gatsby and took her name from a minor character Mrs. Sigourney Howard becoming the next time I do a virtual hotspots tour, I will cover these people and families, scientists, authors, artists, and Philadelphia gentlemen. For more information about tours of Laurel Hill Cemetery, check out our website, thelaurelhillcemetery.com. That is tours both live and virtual. For more information about some of our inhabitants, check out laurelhillcemetery.blog. And of course, the podcast that I do, All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories, which covers both Laurel Hill Cemetery and West Laurel Hill Cemetery. If you want to talk to me, to ask me any questions about any of these people, to check out some of my references, the email is joe at joelex.net. You can find other things that I've done on YouTube. I did a 30-minute special visual podcast on the artist A.B. Frost and his family. If you just put in A.B. Frost and look for tombstones, you will find that. And then something that's not really related to Laurel Hill Cemetery. I told you I was a teacher for many, many years. A talk that I developed called The Wound That Killed Lincoln. It does have some Laurel Hill references, but it is just what it says. It's about the wound that killed Abraham Lincoln from a medical perspective. Both of those are available on YouTube. I thank you for listening. I remind you to stay safe and stay well in these troubled times. And I will catch you again with another presentation in the future. If you are in Philadelphia, please come out to Laurel Hill Cemetery. Visit on your own after you download the app or take one of the many live guided tours or the virtual guided tours that are offered from the website. Thanks for listening.